Hey everyone, before we begin with today's episode, I just wanted to let you all know that starting today the Creepy Fox Christmas Fox design will be available for a limited time only. So if you didn't get a chance to grab it last year, then make sure to grab it now, as it'll be available until December 31st. You can find it in the merch shelf below. It is available in shirts, stickers, sweaters, coffee mugs, and more. It makes a perfect Christmas gift for any Creepy Fox fan. But yes, with that said, make sure to subscribe if you are brand new, and let's get started with these scary stories on today's episode of the Creepy Fox Podcast. Let's get started. A pre-warning. This will be a short story, just because I have some details left out to ensure it's left anonymous. Also, I haven't posted a lot, and I'm on mobile, so sorry for any errors. When I was around 15 years old, I had started babysitting a family with three kids, two boys, one girl. Their mom knew me as the oldest was friends with my little brother, and had asked my mom if I could go help out, just because she had started taking on more shifts, and her husband was doing the same thing. They lived right next to my high school and paid well too, so I agreed despite not really having that much experience. Pretty quickly, I realized that it was going to be difficult. The kids were great, but I was nervous around them. The oldest was fine, just played on his Xbox most of the time, or do homework, but the two youngest were a different story. The middle child, the daughter, was completely obsessed with horror movies, and on more than one occasion, I had to hide the knives from her since she wanted to reenact them and the youngest son tried to set fire to the Christmas tree. I know what kids can be like since I have a lot of younger and older cousins but these ones drove me insane and I would constantly worry about them hurting themselves or each other. If they played up, I would threaten to call their mom, which normally would work. It was after a few months that I realized if I had mentioned the dad, that's when they would really just behave and do what I had asked, so that's what I started doing. Now, I never really ever met the dad. I just knew that the guy was really tall and big built as well, but was always described to me as still being really nice, so I never really thought about it. On this occasion, I had said to the youngest boy that I would call his dad if he didn't stop behaving which resulted in a huge tantrum, so I ended up calling him and explaining the situation. Luckily for me, the dad was getting off of work early, so he said that he would get home as quick as he could and apologizes for the kid's behavior. When I would explained this, the kid was sobbing and ended up locking himself in his room. That day, the dad got home and they weren't joking when they said he was tall. I'm only 5 foot 3 and I was 15 years old when I saw him having to crouch a little to get through the door because of his size. I remember thinking, oh shit, no wonder the kids won't misbehave when he's here. I said hi and apologized for the work call which he just brushed off and said that it needed to be done and not to worry about it. We were both sat on the couch. I can't really remember why but I think we were talking about what days they needed me for. Now, at this stage, the two youngest went outside to play while I was in with the oldest as I had just been tidying a little bit from dinner. I was pretty weirded out because his oldest started to get pretty antsy when asked to go to the shop. He kept making excuses to his dad so I just offered to go myself. I could see the dad visibly frustrated and just wanted to defuse the situation. Now, I would like to point out that everything seemed normal at this point, but I remember feeling really intimidated by the dad. I'd only met him this one time, and spoke for no more than 20 minutes. It turns out that the oldest had said to his mom that he didn't want me left alone with his dad, as he'd apparently been watching me a little too closely during our short encounter. The parents had asked me to babysit later on in that week, which I actually had agreed to. However, in the space of a few days, that quickly changed. I got a text message from mom, 
apologizing for the last minute arrangements, but saying I couldn't babysit. I was a little agitated since I changed plans, but wasn't too bothered and just said it was fine and just let me know when she needs me. She had asked me to come around to get my pay for the last two weeks and I decided to go around before going home. As soon as I was in the house, I could tell that something was off, but not wanting to pry, I just went in to say hi, talked about books for a little bit, and left. It wasn't until the next week, I think, or week after that, where everything kicked off. I came home to my mom being upset and angry, pacing the living room while my stepdad was trying to calm her down. I then immediately went to her asking what was wrong, feeling a little bit worried. Instantly, she just threw her arms around me and started crying and holding me. I had meant to be babysitting, but again, got cancelled on so I was home earlier than what I had said originally. Pulling away confused, I asked her what was wrong again. It turns out that my mom had been trying to get a hold of me, but my phone had died. I had went to babysit and nobody was home, so I just decided to head back on the bus, but wasn't able to let my mom know. She sits me down and starts trying to ask me questions about the dad and my time babysitting. Confused, I would mentioned that I'd only met him once and only really spoke to him on the phone a handful of times when the kids were acting up. Nodding, my mom starts pressing on and asked if anything else happened and kept questioning me saying I could tell her anything. I just looked at her confused and told that nothing had happened and asked what this was all about. I always remember her taking a deep breath and saying, Oh thank God, before letting me know what happened. Now, as I said, the details are vague because this was on the news. It turns out the guy had killed someone while working and had been taken in by the police. During interrogation, it turns out that he admitted to beating his wife and there was speculations of assaults. There was also mention that one of his types were petite girls that had dark hair, pale, which happened to match my description at the time, and my mom was terrified in case something had happened. I'm turning 23 years old this year, and it still gives me shivers. I remember feeling like I was going to throw up and had a sinking feeling in my stomach. My mom held me close crying because she had worried sick all day and she was scared in case something had happened. Needless to say, I stopped babysitting for the family right there and then. I had felt so awful for the wife that she was honestly one of the nicest women I would ever met. About a week later, I got a text from her as it turns out I had left some books there, so I had said I would go get them. When I saw her, my heart sank. She had obviously not slept and was putting on a brave face for the kids who weren't sure what was going on. We ended up sitting in the kitchen and I gave her a hug, just trying to comfort her. I had mentioned that if she needed help with the kids, since he was gone, I would try to help but she immediately refuses as it turned out people had started attacking the house. She gave me my stuff, paid for the wages with a little more added. I had completely forgot and said she appreciated it but it would be better off if I just took a step back from the family as she didn't want me getting hurt for being associated with them. To this day, I still think about them and it still scares me after thinking about what could have happened. I still talk to the younger kids who are a lot older and even help tutor the younger girl. I helped the oldest when he started high school because I noticed the kids bullying him for what his dad had done which was awful considering it wasn't the fault of the family. But yeah, let's not meet, you psychopath. At the time this took place, I was 16 years old. I'm 25 years old now, so I'll do my best to get the whole story down for you guys. It was Halloween in my small South Louisiana town. It was a crisp night. The temperature was in the mid-80s, and the heat showed no signs of slacking off. 
I was walking around with my older sister and our friend Brooke. My sister had gone as a cat and Brooke had gone as a witch. I made the awful decision of wearing a formal gown since I decided to go as a zombie prom queen. I had a crown and everything. I was drowning in that dress though. I was so hot and the corset back was restricting my breathing. It was about 8.40 and all the kids were pretty much cleared out of the street. We were making our way to the park next to the city hall where my mother was supposed to pick us up. We were supposed to be there at 9. The three of us were about 6 blocks away at this point and my sister had stopped to talk to a friend of hers. I was not stopping though. It was close to time for my mom to pick us up and I was not going to be late. Also, I was miserable in that stupid dress and I wanted to go home. I had carried on for about two blocks down before I noticed that my sister and my friend had both stayed behind. I was annoyed, to say the least. I only had four blocks to go, however, before I could lay down in my mother's minivan. Now, being alone in the dark was starting to give me the creeps. The yellow street lights didn't do the ambience any favors, but I kept my pace and I kept walking. That's until I heard the rumble of a muffler coming up behind me. I moved all the way off the road. The large black truck came past very quickly and then turned to the left in front of me. I passed the intersection and I only had three blocks left. Then I heard the truck again. I never moved back onto the road so I didn't bother looking back. It wasn't too strange that the same truck had passed again. The third time they passed however, they slowed down for a good 30 seconds or so. That is what scared me. I didn't recognize the truck and the windows were tinted heavily. As soon as I thought I could see a bit of a face, they peeled out and disappeared around a corner. I made another block before I heard the truck again. I was two blocks away from my ride and I was scared to start running. I already couldn't breathe because of the dress and I was terrified I was going to pass out. As soon as I heard the truck, my stomach wrenched. I still kept walking however, only a bit faster than I began. I kept my eyes down as well and I watched my own shadow as the headlights came closer. I then heard the brakes and I made the decision to now run, but I was too late. I realized how close they were to me. I then felt a sharp pain on the back of my head and I looked up the best I could to see an arm sticking out the window. An eagle clutching a sword was tattooed on his upper forearm. He had my hair wrapped around his fist as well. Before I could really comprehend the situation, he pumped the gas and was dragging me along the side of his truck. I was running as best as I could, clawing his arm. I was crying and screaming. The only thing that kept running through my mind was that if I tripped, I was going to be run over. This man was just laughing and I was completely helpless. As soon as it started, he let me go. I then fell to my knees on the asphalt. I tore my dress, skinned my palms, and my scalp was on fire. I was inconsolable and I was hyperventilating too, but I stood up and wiped my face. Then I looked around and I felt absolutely violated. I looked back at the way I'd come from and I realized that this man had dragged me by my hair for a whole block and a half. Once I caught my head, I ran across the street to the park. My mother was nowhere to be seen. So I climbed into the enclosed slide and I just curled up and cried. I don't know how long I was laying there before I heard my mother calling my name. I came out and she was walking up the street calling for me. I then walked over to her and she looked me up and down and she started freaking out. Apparently, I had blood on my face and dress from my hands. She then ran to me and was asking me what happened and kept looking me up and down for a gash or something worse. I couldn't find my voice. I just held on to her and cried. We spent the next few hours at the police station 
filing out a report. A long story short, nothing ever came of it. My sister got into trouble with my parents for not being at the city hall on time. She would ultimately be grounded. My mother had actually left city hall to go and look for us. She found my sister where I left her, and my sister hadn't even realized that I hadn't stayed. I got into trouble for not staying with my sister, but I didn't get grounded. I'm still pretty mad that the dress was ruined, and I also lost the damned crown. I'm even angrier that the man was never caught. This Halloween, I will be out with my godchild, trick-or-treating. It'll be the first one that I've gone out for in the nine years since this happened. Some background. I live in a secluded ranch with seven other neighbors. This ranch is located about a half mile from the entrance, and to get there, you have to go through dirt roads. When this happened, it had been raining for a couple of days, so the roads were barely drivable. This started out as any other night of this year so far. I had been taking on a few more hours at work to put in practice and get training for an advanced position in my career, which hopefully I'll get soon. But I digress, let's get back to it. I've been getting home at around 12 to 1 a.m. My usual routine when I get home is I either eat the Mexican food I bought from a 24-7 taco place or reheat the dinner my mom left for me. I take my food over to my mom, turn on my Xbox, and put on something to stream while I take dabs and eat. This particular night, I got in a few pre-rolled joints from work as a little gift from a friend. I decided to go smoke them before I begin eating, so the munchies hit the spot just right. I have two doors to my backyard, a sliding glass door in the living room, and a side door at the end of the house, next to my room. I went out the side door, and then sat on the wood railing, just outside, and sparked them up. The way this side yard is set up, if I sit on the railing, I am facing the street, where I have a view of my next door neighbor's full yard, and two of my front door neighbor's houses. As I was listening to music, and smoking as well, I saw a figure running across from my next door neighbor's house, right towards my front door neighbor's house. Now, listen, I know I was high. I was one joint in and already on my second, but my tolerance is stupid high. This was not some paranoid illusion or my mind playing tricks on me. I saw a figure move and I felt the blood drain from my face and my high died instantly. I'd never been in this situation before, so I didn't really know what to do. My neighbors have one of those metal screen doors, and I heard the guy clearly trying to rattle it open. That's when I knew shit could go down. I went back inside, basically ran to the front door, and locked it. I then peered out the people, and I saw him pacing around frantically. I called my mom and told her about what was currently happening. My mom then called her friend, the neighbor who lives in the house, the man was currently trying to open the door towards, to warn her. While this was all going down, my neighbor two houses down was awake and saw some parts of the incident. I talked to him the following day, and this is what he said about it. Everyone in the property has dogs, ranging from my little husky slash pit to annoying chihuahuas. Anyway. He was up watching television in his living room that has a view of this street. He said that he heard his dogs barking non-stop. A few minutes, all the dogs in the entire neighborhood were barking. This freaked him out a little. So he went out to his window and saw the man going from house to house, trying to open every car in the place. He then got his daughter to call 911. As I said before, we live in a secluded ranch. So when people come over, we have to give them directions. They usually end up getting lost about a mile or two down the road if they type our address on maps. It took about half an hour from the moment she called to the moment the police arrived. By the time the police arrived, the crackhead had locked himself in my neighbor's car 
which was roughly about 20 to 30 feet from my door. I had a perfect view from the people. We had called some more of the neighbors to warn them about what was going on. Now, this started at around 1 a.m., and it was around slash near 2 a.m. when the police arrived. Once I heard the sirens, I called it a night because I was tired as shit and I had to be back in the lab at 8 a.m. My mom and our neighbor worked together and are close friends as well. While at work, she proceeded to tell her what the police said about the man they found inside her car. She told me this later that day when I got home from work. So once the police arrived, they knew where the man was hiding, so they approached the vehicle and then apprehended him. This man had an arrest warrant out for him as he had previously escaped a jail. The irony is that across this street, there is a state pen. Anyway, this guy was amped up on stimulant, either crack or meth. He was also shit-faced. This damn animal then proceeded to take a shit and then puke all over my neighbor's car. I do not want to get into those details, however. Not then. Not now. Not ever. All I know is that it's been about four weeks since then, and they barely started driving it again a few days ago. That is by far the closest and a worst encounter I've had with a cracked out person. It was god dang scary. I'd probably shit my pants if I woke up to one inside my room. TLDR Tweaking drunk crackhead walked for god knows how long to end up in our secluded ranch. He tried to break and enter in every house, ended up locking himself in a neighbor's car. He puked and took a shit inside said car before the police came and apprehended him. Crackhead who showed up out of the blue and violated my neighbor's car. Let's not me. Many years ago, I was driving home from work on a pretty busy two-lane road. I was in the left lane with a line of cars behind me and a line of cars to my right. We were all driving a little over the speed limit, which at a posted 40 miles an hour is not slow nor fast. As I was driving, I noticed an SUV come out of a business across the street. He cut across the oncoming traffic, nearly hitting those cars, and was headed straight for me. I realized if I did not slow down or move, I would be the lucky gal to smash into his bumper, possibly causing an even larger accident. Now, I have fractions of a fraction of a second to make my decision. Hitting my brakes was not an option. Moving to the right was not an option either. So I sped up, jumped the left-hand curb, and slid in front of the SUV like a boss. In my mind, I was a hero. I just managed to avoid being smashed into while not causing anyone else any damage. Boss. So, there I am, only a few minutes away from the turn into my one way in slash one way out neighborhood and I notice this SUV is still behind me. I have been navigating through the brakes and traffic pretty smoothly, so I think to myself, This gentleman or lady just likes how I play chess with my car to avoid slow drivers. I slip into the right lane, getting ready for the last stretch of main road driving, when the SUV does the same thing. No big deal. I put on my blinker to indicate my right turn, as you should always do. Don't be lazy. And so does the SUV. It is a pretty decent sized neighborhood with a public park at the end of the main street, so I still think nothing of it. But to be on the safer side, I start turning on some random streets to see if the SUV does the same thing. The neighborhood is a grid, so almost every road eventually can take you to my house, which is on the furthest street from the main road. As I drive towards my house, I realize that not a single one of my five other roommates are home. With a quick glance, I see the SUV is still in my rearview mirror. I know most every other cars on this street, and this is for sure not one of them. Anyway, I pull into my regular spot, 
which is luckily the closest to the front door. I then grab my phone and pull out my keys. The SUV has now parked in my driveway. Polite for a creep, I suppose. I get out of my car and into my house as quick as possible. After locking the front door, I rush into my roommate's bedroom with my heart in my throat. Flashback. Another lucky for me is that only days prior to this, he had purchased a few new guns. And before the guns had even been remotely near ammo, he let his girlfriend and I learn to work the basic mechanics of some of the pistols, as well as his new shotgun. I never even held a real gun before, so this was an excellent lesson. He then loaded the guns, locked away the pistols, and put the shotgun in his closet. He made sure we all knew that all the guns were loaded, no more handling them willy-nilly, and where they were located as well, just in case. Flash forward. So with super sweaty palms, and either no pulse or a heartbeat that was too fast to notice, I grabbed the shotgun and headed back to the front door. From the window on the door, I could see a very unassuming white man in his mid-forties walking up toward the house. He has a backpack on. He is smiling as well. Any other incident I would have greeted him and listened to whatever religion he was trying to sell me and then sent him on his merry way. I don't think that was his intention however. So instead of doing the smart thing and calling the police with the phone in my back pocket, I decided to do the you only get to do this once, hopefully, thing. As he gets too close for comfort to my front door. I quietly unlocked it. He then takes another step. I then kick the door open, cock the shotgun with one hand. I had practiced that move and was very proud that I could do that. And then I pointed it at him. He froze. I froze. I don't know what you want, but you need to turn around, get back in your car, and get the hell out of here. I said this in a stern and powerful voice. Something that my 5 foot 5, 120 pound frame could muster. With sour frown, the man backed away slowly, never taking his eyes off from mine. He slid into his SUV after that, and left. As soon as his SUV left, I went back inside, locked the front door, gently placed the shotgun on the floor, and then slid down the floor and started weeping. I have never once wanted to ever have to be in that situation, and I hope it never happens again. And before you ask, no, I did not call the police. I never got a chance to see his plates, and the only information I could have given them is what I just told you. This happened when I was about 12 or 13 years old. My best friend at the time came from a somewhat troubled home. His parents had divorced when he was little, and he normally lived with his mom, who was apparently struggling with various drug addictions, and having strange new drug dealer boyfriends every few months. So him and I spent a lot of our time out running wild in the neighborhood, instead of being at home. His dad lived on the other side of town, but there may or may have not been restraining orders on him, preventing him from coming to the mother's house. My friend, Ben, would go spend the weekend at his dad's house once every two months or so. A few times, I got invited to go spend the night over there. His dad was living like a bachelor and had lots of great video games, movies, always let us crank up the music and party, and also let us go wild out in the neighborhoods and the hills back behind the house. One time, I went over to hang out, and spend the night over there with Ben, and the mood was very different in the house. We went downstairs, where Ben showed me blood stains all over the carpet and the walls near the foosball table. It looked like it was splattered and swung about violently, all maroon and brown. There were obvious blood splatters on the walls, where something with blood on it had been swung around, and there was also big dark blood puddles in the carpet, his dad was upstairs resting, with bandages all around his neck and head. The story goes like this. This all happened a few nights before the weekend, meaning Ben still was not there, 
and was at his mother's house still. Ben's dad, who at the time had a girlfriend living with him, went out drinking at the bar. He made friends with some guy at the bar, and the guy suggested going back to Ben's dad's place to hang out, drink in private, and play some foosball since Ben's dad had mentioned he had a foosball table. They were all really drunk, and Ben's dad's girlfriend went upstairs to go to bed, leaving Ben's dad and the stranger downstairs, very late at night, listening to some 80s hair metal and playing foosball. At some point, Ben's dad was busy doing something with a foosball table when the stranger backed away from the table, went to the wall, and picked up one of Ben's dad's golf clubs that was laying there. Without saying anything else, he swung out and started beating Ben's dad with the golf club. At some point, Ben's dad was laying on the floor, and the man stood over him and started talking. He told Ben's dad that he had been watching him for a very long time. He said that his way of life was garbage, and that he's a horrible person, and that he, the stranger, was there to show him the error of his ways. He told him that he knows everything about him as well. He knows where he works. He knows where he goes. He knows where he drinks. He knows his whole family situation. He even knows his son's name and where he lives. He knows his son's friend's name. You can imagine how much this part in particular freaked me out. He said he better get his life together or he's going to come back to finish the job. Then he started beating him with the golf club again until he was completely unconscious, and then he left, leaving the front door wide open. From there, apparently the dad eventually got up, was able to get the girlfriend upstairs to wake up, and call the police. Police came, took down the story, checked for fingerprints, checked around the house, made sure everything was safe, and that was it. Ben's dad went to the hospital, got a bunch of stitches, and bandages, and was presently upstairs resting while me and Ben were downstairs, who were looking at the bloodstains all over the carpet and the walls. That's basically the end of the story. His dad never really changed his ways much, but the guy apparently never came back, and nobody else was beaten with a golf club. Sometimes, I think about how scary it'd be if that guy was still somehow lingering around. It was roughly 5 p.m. I was in the passenger seat of the car my girlfriend was driving. She was learning to drive, and I was 21 years old at the time. I was allowed to be her sit-in experienced driver. She was 19 at the time, and fairly inexperienced on the roads. I come from a fairly well-off family, so I paid for her insurance. Anyway, on this day, she was driving around a roundabout that is notorious in the area for being difficult for anyone that doesn't know the road very well. She had to exit where two lanes join into one. As she's going around, a black Voxel Casa is in the right lane that soon joins on to the left, the one we are in. He indicates that he's coming over, and I tell my girlfriend to slow down and let him in front of us. She proceeds to slow down but the car doesn't move from the lane. She then must have gotten impatient and bolted past him, something she admittedly shouldn't have really done. In the rearview mirror, I saw the driver's middle finger fly at us, and I tell my girlfriend that although he should have gone in front of us, she was also in the wrong. She apologized and said she wouldn't do it again. We carried on driving until we were near our house. She pulled up in the driveway and we both got out of the car. All of a sudden, that same vehicle who flipped us off pulls up on the curb to our house. The driver gets out and starts walking over to us. He was an odd-looking man, roughly 35 years old, 5 feet and 8 inches tall, with dirty blonde hair, and was wearing a casual business suit with blue jeans. He stormed over to us, and started yelling at my girlfriend about how she could have killed him. Also, that he would like to see their roles reversed. I see my girlfriend is almost crying at this point, 
and I ask the man to calm down. He basically tells me to get bent and goes to push me out of the way. I push him back harder and tell him to get off our property. He then leaps at my girlfriend, arms stretched. I grabbed him by the waist with both arms and slammed him to the ground. I may have been fairly young, but I'm not a weakling. With this, the man runs to his car and drives away. I hug my girlfriend, tears rolling down her face. Fortunately, she doesn't wear makeup or that would have been a mess to clean up. Anyway, after a rather quiet dinner, we played on the Xbox for a couple of hours and then we went to sleep. I woke up the next morning to my girlfriend frantically shaking me to wake me up. I smiled until I saw the sheer panic in her face. It was as if she had seen a ghost. She then dragged me to the window and guess who was outside staring directly in my eyes? The man from the previous day. I thought about calling the police and suggested it to my girlfriend, but we never did. We kept all the curtains closed as we got dressed and ate our breakfast, both of us wondering what he was doing back. My girlfriend had to work, but I had a day off, but I insisted I drive her instead of her taking the bus, with of course the current situation that we were in. We opened the door slowly, and the man was now on the other side of the street, but still looking directly at us. We kept eye contact with him all the way up the driveway until we got to the car. As we were getting in, we heard a noise. The man was walking towards us with a crowbar in his hands. At this moment, we jumped in the car and sped off fast. After dropping my girlfriend off at work, I went to the car park to drive back home. When I see the same vehicle parked a few spaces away from me, but with no sign of the man. I quickly ran inside my girlfriend's workplace to find him sitting in the waiting room. When I entered, he glared at me with what looked like an animalistic state of mind. I walked over to him, furious. What the hell is your problem? I asked quietly, but with a serious force behind me. He didn't answer. He just continued to glare at me until I saw something in his coat pocket. It was a knife. I backed away and left the building and called my girlfriend on her office phone. I basically told her that the crazy man was in the building with a knife. Then I followed by saying that she needs to stay in her office and I then called the police. After explaining everything over the phone, they arrived in roughly seven to nine minutes. Fortunately, the man was still in the building. Two police officers then entered the building. Around five minutes later, they returned with a man in handcuffs and the knife in a clear evidence bag. My girlfriend's boss let her go home early and we drove home. We never found out who the man was and never saw or heard from him again. But we both still think to this day, what if I hadn't drove her to work that day? What if I hadn't seen the knife only just poking out of his coat? So many what ifs. It's now two years later, and we still think about that man from time to time. My brother is seven years older than me, so when I was nine or ten years old, he was in high school and had to hide from our parents that he smoked and dipped tobacco. As a result, most days of the week after he got home from school, I was homeschooled by the way, we'd go out into the woods for an hour or two. We lived way out in the country, in an already rural part of East Texas, so there were plenty of woods to explore. The land south of our house was also owned by a mining company and my parents didn't want us going out there, so we always crossed a fence to the north of our house and explored the woods out there. Very likely some local's property that we had no business being on, but when you live out in the country, you figure you'll have plenty of sign before you accidentally walk into someone's backyard. After a few months of venturing out in this area, never traveling more than an hour's distance from our house and always in the daylight. 
we decided one day we'd just keep walking and walking. My brother smoked and spit into a Dr. Pepper bottle. We entered big pastures and dove back into even deeper woods. Whenever we've talked about it, we've always said that we must have traveled at least a mile, but we usually say far more. Eventually, we came across a circular pond I distinctly remember, which had a much higher rim on one side. My brother explained that this was because a tractor had dug it out and piled up more dirt on one side than the others. We kept going past the pond and we entered another patch of woods. As we came out, we saw that the tree line curved around sharply to the right and the clearing we now stood in opened up far wider. We went in that direction and while my memory of getting there is a little bit hazy, I know we suddenly came across a very large white building which was surrounded by high fence. There was a gate large enough for vehicles to move in and move out, and a dirt roading leading away from the facility. We could hear the sounds of activity and could see people walking around the outside of the fence near the gate. I'm afraid any other detail I could give at this point might be colored by false memory or exaggerations from an imaginative young brain, so I'll wait to talk to my brother about it more before I go any further. At that moment, we both felt the spine-tingling terror, alerting the body that something was about to go very wrong. We were not supposed to be here. We were at the very least going to get into some serious trouble. We were standing in the middle of a clearing, gawking at a facility of some kind, on what was obviously someone else's property, and we were seeing something deep out in the woods that we had never known was here. All this time we'd spent walking around these woods, if we'd just gone a ways further, we would have stumbled across this. I remember standing there for a moment longer, asking my brother what this could possibly be. He told me something along the lines of, I have no clue, but we should really get out of here. The tone of his voice truly freaked me out, and I remember running hard back the way we came, crossing the same pond, and cutting a path as close as possible to the route we had traveled. When we finally stopped, out of breath, my brother told me that in no way shape or form would I utter a word of this to our parents. They were spankers and awful grounders so he knew the trouble he'd be in for taking his little brother into what was quite possible danger. After that day, we kept going out in those woods, but never that far. Eventually, my brother got caught with a can of skull, and my dad made him eat the whole can and puke it up on the porch. Being an easily intimidated little kid, it wasn't hard to get more information out of me about my brother's smoking and dipping habits, but I never brought up the facility that we found. Over the years, my brother and I have brought this story up many times. Our parents have gotten way laxer since we've all grown up, and we've even told them this story, to my mother's retroactive shock. We've added a lot of other weird ones to our arsenal in the time since, as our family has always lived by huge areas of land so that we could wander around on, but this is one of our favorites. It's always, remember the time we almost got killed by those government researchers? Remember the time we found that crazy building in the woods with those people walking around it? But for the past few days, this event has been really bugging me. I told my wife about it in detail, and she was pretty amused, to say the least. I thought I'd look around in Google Maps a little bit at the area that we grew up in, something I'm honestly surprised I've never done for these specific reasons before. And what I found, or haven't found, is really bizarre. Moving north from my old house, which has since burned down and left an ugly scar on the satellite image on Google Maps, I can very clearly make out the woods we spent our time in. When I go further north, I can see several large clearings, followed by more wooded areas. Eventually, I even found the circular pond, and I'm positive I can make out the higher end of the pond that we stood on, 
as my brother explained how it had been made. When I drag the map further, I see what looks to be the clearing and the sharp curve of the tree line to where we saw the facility, but there's nothing there. No trace of a building, no evidence of a dirt road which leads away from an old structure. It's just pasture and more trees. In fact, when I zoom out and look at the whole area, it doesn't seem possible for there to have been an operation of the scale that we saw out there at all. Just a little ways further north, the land becomes nothing but pasture, with houses pressed up against a county road. For people to have come and gone from this area, they would have had to have had a road of some kind, as well as power lines, which would be stretched out to the building. But there's nothing like that on Google. In fact, there's really no, here it was, spot on the map. It's like it was never there to begin with. It has been a few years since we've talked about it, so I texted my brother earlier today so I could ask him if he still remembered this happening. He called me immediately after and said, Hell yeah, man. That was a really weird day. You know how good I used to be in the woods? That shit, however, really freaked me out. We had to get out of there. And this whole event feels more and more like something that we walked into that we shouldn't have seen. I still remember the feeling of dread upon finding the place and knowing that something bad would happen if we stuck around. I'm going to try and send him this post later so he can read it, as well as look at the Google Maps for himself to see if he sees anything different. I'm a security guard for an alarm response company. We answer alarms for businesses as well as private residences. 99% of the time, it's a motion detector set off by a cat or a restaurant forgot to disarm their stuff before the stock truck arrived to unload. In this case, I was called out to a house where the back door alarm was set off, like it thought someone had opened it. The owner was out of town, but she was alerted by her app and had her mother meet me there. We checked the door. It's locked. We figure maybe someone tried the door but it didn't budge, setting off the alarm. But there's a light on inside. The mom mentions this to daughter on the phone. Daughter says she isn't sure if she left the light on or not. It's a good idea to make people think that someone's home, but she just isn't sure. That gave me a bad tingle. The mother wanted to go inside to check. However, she didn't have a spare key. The neighbor did but they were asleep and mom didn't want to wake them up. So I fill out my papers and I go back to my normal patrol routes. An hour later, the same home sends an alert out. I'm the only one in my city zone, so I answer it again. When I pull up, police and CSI are there talking to the mother and the now awake neighbor. They are reviewing video footage sent to them by the daughter. I look at the footage. Four armed men wearing masks and hoodies came out of the bathroom a minute after the mother and I left. They proceeded to then rob the place. They had broken in and locked the door behind them for appearances. They're the ones who turned on the light. The mother told me three guys had robbed her daughter's home a month before. Somehow, they knew when this girl would be out of town. They appeared to be smart robbers desiring a quiet robbery without conflict. But they brought guns, so they were prepared to shoot their way out of trouble if need to do so. The mother had wanted to go in. If she had a key or woken the neighbor for the key, we would likely have been shot dead by these guys when we went inside. Work doesn't give me Kevlar vests or anything. If I ever get another house call and someone is there, I am not going inside, no matter what is asked of me. Needless to say, I count myself fortunate the way was blocked this time, because I was prepared to foolishly go in and check if I could. 
For the 1% of calls where something is actually off, it has never been as bad as this one. So to the armed robbers, let's not meet. This is going to be a bit long. So I had a best friend in high school named Lena. We were friends for about a year and a half and we would spend almost every weekend at her house listening to music, watching scary movies, and gossiping. She was just a little bit crazy, the type of girl to beat up her boyfriend's exes unprovoked. She actually did that once, and also catfish people. I say we were best friends, but actually it was more like I looked up to her, and she liked that she could boss me around and hang out with me whenever she pleased. She was extremely manipulative and two-faced. She had a hobby of being nice to girls at school and then going on their social media and making fun of everything they posted. She would befriend people just to get information from them. When we were friends, Lena was dating this guy named Nolan. They dated for about a year and a half and had lots of troubles the last six months or so. He would go drinking most weekends and she would cry in the middle of the night and blow up his phone, yelling at him and making him feel guilty. She was borderline psychotic when it came to his exes or the girls he was friends with, and they just weren't really working out, but they stayed together anyway. At some point, Nolan got Lena pregnant, and one of Lena's other friends, whose name was Autumn, became pregnant at the same time from the guy I was in love with. Naturally, I wanted nothing to do with Autumn, but because they were pregnant together, Elena started hanging out with Autumn most weekends and neglected our friendship. After about a month, I became fed up with it and started ghosting her. At first, she tried to apologize, but I was not having it whatsoever, since the other girl was dating the guy that I had been in love with for two years, and I was jealous and childish. So eventually, Lena got pissed at me and stopped trying. A few months went by and Lena had the baby. Noland and Lena stayed together to take care of their son, but their relationship was absolutely horrendous at that point. Lena cheated on him and Nolan decided he wanted out to the relationship, but continued to see his son and buy things for him. However, Lena and Lena's mother made things very difficult for him by constantly changing the days that he could see his son and refusing to let him take his own son anywhere besides Lena's house. Lena's mother would also throw out the Christmas presents from Nolan, ignore his phone calls, and eventually told him he wasn't allowed to the house. Nolan begged for months to see his son, but it was clear Lena and her mother didn't want him in the picture. Nolan offered to pay child support, but they didn't want that either. They just wanted him gone. So, he stopped trying, and apparently, even that wasn't what they wanted. Elena took to social media to talk about how Nolan was a deadbeat. She told everyone she knew that being a single mother was really hard, and the bad daddy refused to take care of his kid. A year after they broke up, I met Nolan in person. We had been talking online for a couple of months about Lena. We had shared stories about her crazy meltdowns and her manipulative tendencies. And we talked about the time he came to her house while I was there and attempted to scare her by jumping out when she went out the front door, but instead accidentally jumped out at me. He thought it was the funniest thing ever that my face stayed stone cold and I just said, sup. We had a similar sense of humor. And at the time, I had no one. I had just come out of one of the worst depressive episodes of my life. It had lasted for a good year, and I dropped out of school, been doing drugs, isolating myself for weeks at a time, and considering ending myself as well. He was the one to help bring me back from the brink. He was kind, and he was my support system. We were just friends at first. When Lena caught wind of our friendship, she reached out to me. At this point, we hadn't been friends for a year and a half. We caught up 
and talked about what had been happening in our lives. She asked what was going on with Nolan, and I told her we were just friends. Everything seemed fine. That's when her erratic behavior had started. She would randomly block me on social media, and then unblock me a month or two later. And sometimes, we would talk, like, how are you? Everything good? And then the next day, I'm blocked. At one point, I asked one of her friends to get her to tell me why she was doing it, because, of course, I was confused. So, she unblocked me and told me she was salty about the situation with Nolan and the fact that I was friendly with him. I asked her why she kept making up with me, and then suddenly getting pissed off again, and cutting me off. I told her I was tired of thinking things were good, only for her to turn around, and pretend like we had never said anything to each other. That's when she said she could block me again, or keep me unblocked. Whatever, I was fine with it, but she felt I had done her wrong by abandoning her during her pregnancy and befriending her ex-boyfriend. So then I tried to explain to her why Nolan was my friend. I tried to tell her that Nolan was all I had in the darkest times of my life. I tried to tell her why her neglecting me for Autumn hurt my feelings, but she wasn't having it. I understand where she was coming from. I do, and I acknowledge the fact that I acted childish and in a cruel way as well. But I had tried to make up with her multiple times. I tried really hard, and she couldn't even stick with whether she could forgive me or not. So I told her to block me again and be done with it. She told me she wouldn't block me again, and then she gave me her blessing with Nolan. She said she was fine if we wanted to date, and she said she hoped I had a good life, and I said the same thing to her. And I really meant it. We had a bad end, but I was glad we could at least wish each other well. It was a few months after I last spoke to her that Nolan and I started dating. I had waited so long because I was worried about Lena, even though we weren't friends anymore. But she had given me her blessing, and she was dating someone new, so I went with it. It was around this time that I received a friend request from a girl on Facebook named Casey. Casey said she lived in a big city in my state, and since we had mutual friends, and I had once gone to school in that city, I assumed that we had gone to school together, and I just didn't remember her. She seemed like a real person. She claimed to work at Hooters, and had made posts about how her workdays went, had several pictures of the same girl, and made frequent posts about her ex-boyfriend. I accepted the friend request, and she messaged me telling me how pretty she thought I was. I thanked her, and told her to message me anytime she wanted to chat. For the next few months, I was clueless. I went about my regular life, posting about the things me and Nolan did, getting my GED, hanging out with friends, visiting my mother, etc. Occasionally, I would see strange posts on my timeline from Casey, but didn't think much about it because I had over 1,000 friends on Facebook and I rarely saw them. They were mostly posts about how much she hated her baby daddy and how her line of work really sucked. But there were two posts in particular that caught my eye. One was a post that seemed to be referencing something that I posted the day before, and the other was of her saying, we all know a dirty hoe named with my first name in the blank. So I went to her profile and then clicked through months and months of posts. Some were about her line of work. Everything else was related to me and Nolan. Everything. There were posts of her complaining about her deadbeat baby daddy who would buy things for everyone but his kid. Posts about how sad she felt about the breakup. Posts about how she missed me and thought of me as a sister, which is bullshit, and I'll explain why later. Posts about how I stole her boyfriend, also bullshit, and a my rate of posts shit-talking me. She made fun of my hobbies, had directly referenced some of my posts, and talked about how much she hated me. She said I was a dirty hoe, and in her later posts, even went so far as to put my initials or full first name in the post. 
She even had people in the comments egging her on and talking shit as well, even though no one knew who she was talking about. But I did. She mentioned things only the two of us knew. She referenced our past experiences. It was undoubtedly Elena. I messaged Casey and told her I knew it was Lena. She played dumb and told me the initials were of another girl that she knew. When I looked up the name she gave me, not a single person on Facebook had that name. When I told her that, she brushed over it and tried to get me to talk about Lena. So I played along and talked hardcore shit about Lena. I lied about a lot of things in an attempt to get her to out herself, but in the end, all she did was send a screenshot of our conversation to Lena's account in an attempt to make it look like Casey was real and was trying to help Lena out by showing what kind of person I was. Casey then immediately deleted her account. She didn't block me. She deleted it. I had a friend and my dad check and neither of them could find Casey's profile. So then another month went by and I found out she had reactivated the account, and because I can't block a deleted account, she was in my friends list again, and had access to my profile for who knows how many days. So, I blocked her. She then sent me a friend request, and a follow request as well, on three other websites, under the Casey name, which I also blocked. It was around that time that me and Nolan began to get a lot of friend requests from obviously fake accounts. We would report them and block them and try to pretend she wasn't going insane. One of these fake accounts was extremely obvious because it poked both me and Nolan on the same day, at the same time. She was taunting us, I guess. I blocked that account too. Now please be aware that at this time, Lena had married her boyfriend. She was doing this while married to someone else. A year later, I thought it had stopped. And one day, I went to the Casey account on my friend's Facebook because I wanted to see if she was still posting about me. And when I scrolled down, I realized I'd missed a post last time. This post was Lena mocking the fact that my mother, yes, my birth mother, called her frequently to talk shit about me and give her information on me and Nolan. Turns out my mother and Lena went to the same college and my mother thought what better way to make friends than by helping someone stalk my daughter. She would ask me about mine and Nolan's relationship often. She talked shit about Lena and would act like the perfect mother to my face. She didn't raise me so I didn't trust her 100%. For that reason, I never gave her my phone number, address, or any other information I felt was private. But when my dog went missing, she tried to convince me to post my address on Facebook. She kept saying how important it was that people knew exactly where he went missing from. What? Horseshit. Thank God I didn't, because I might have woken up to Lena punching my head in. Or worse. For a while, there I was legitimately paranoid. Every time I went to the store, or I went outside, I was watching my surroundings closely. Because if Lena was willing to beat the shit out of a girl Nolan had dated for three weeks, unprovoked, what would she do to me if she saw me in public? Would she kill me? I'd never met someone so obsessive. Now let me just say, Lena was a horrible friend. She was manipulative, bossy, judgmental, rude erratic, narcissistic, and two-faced. When I felt my first heartbreak, she spent all night talking shit about the guy, saying I deserved better. Eventually, I talked shit with her to make myself feel better. And what does she do? She messages him on Facebook and tells him everything I said about him. She guilt-tripped me about having other friends. She convinced me to abandon one of my friends just because she didn't approve of her. She would ignore me when there were other people around. If I complained about anyone, she would go tell that person what I said, even if she had said something worse about them. She would go through people's Facebooks and laugh at them and talk about how dorky they were. 
and not in a nice way. In a, this person is scum for being a bit dorky kind of way. She would make me feel ridiculous for liking the things I did, and I never felt like I could be myself around her. It amazes me how many people Lena has manipulated. Even her poor husband probably doesn't know she was a stalker. So, yeah, there you have it. Lena cyberstalked me for two years, and if I had given my mother my address, it might have become actual stalking. She hasn't been trying to stalk me for a while now. I cut my mother off and deleted all but 40 people off of my Facebook, and I made all my social media accounts private to keep this from happening again. I'm hoping I won't ever hear from Lena again. The last obvious sign I've gotten of her trying to stalk me is a fake account that sent me a friend request about three months ago. It was an account that was a few months old. It had the same last name as my friend, who told me he didn't know her and only liked two Facebook pages, one of which was a grocery store page and the other was my page. My obscure Facebook page, mind you. My page that has spaces in between the letters and Japanese letters in the name. My page that you have to either know the exact name of or have a link to find. My page that I had already had to ban Lena and Casey from because both accounts also liked it. Sometimes I wonder if Lena is even trying to be secretive or if she's just stupid. At least her attempts are few and far between now, so I don't consider her to be stalking me anymore. Anyway, if you finished this story, sorry for such a long story. I was young when all this stuff happened, and I made some really dumb choices, so go easy on me please. I know I'm not 100% faultless in this, and yes, me and Nolan are still together, and we will be celebrating our 4 year anniversary in a couple of months. I was out with four friends. We were all, or were, aged in our late teens, going camping for one of their bachelor parties. We had spent all day hanging out, going on trails, and jumping off the cliffs into the water. The girls there were quite fine, I might add. When it came time to actually camp for the night, we chose to go more off-road than the normal sites for we would have had to pay fines, and there was a lot of people, making it difficult to even find a room. So we found a nice, legal place to set up for the night, and that's what we did. Now a little backstory about this site that's important. It was basically the top of a hill, kind of like a mini plateau, surrounded by lots of desert area, southern Arizona, and small brush. Not sure which direction, but to about a mile, probably less than one direction, was an abandoned building of sorts. It seemed like it had been used for irrigation or some kind of growing of plants, and there was a wasp nest, so we avoided the area, obviously. Still an interesting thing to see, looked like some kind of fancy ass cabin in the middle of nowhere from the campsite, not even lying about that last thing. It was really weird to finally figure out what it was. Anyway, fast forward a few hours to when it's dark and we're all still sitting around the campfire playing cards against humanity, a favorite of ours. Also, it's worthy to note that I was buzzing very hard off a classic Cuban style cigar and I was feeling sick due to that. We all had cigars, but there was no drugs or alcohol of any kind. However, don't get me wrong, I used to be quite the avid stoner. It is now quite dark, and the only light is really from the campfire or from our lamps slash technology. Out of nowhere, one of us notices headlights going down the very specific trail that only leads to our campsite and the aforementioned abandoned structure. These headlights turn out to be a truck towing a trailer later on and this vehicle was moving quite slow, which technically is understandable, but still unnerving. We started to speculate that it might be a park ranger 
or someone of the like. For the purposes of the rest of the story, I will just refer to the vehicle as he, despite the fact that the gender of said vehicle's driver was never identified. He drove past the turnoff to our campsite and continued to the structure, where he parked and turned off his lights. At this point, we were genuinely concerned. From what I can remember, the next maybe half hour or so, the truck remained like so, not producing any light. This was especially bad, considering we were making lots of light and noise as well, and had no way to see if someone was approaching from the surrounding darkness, except flashlights. After enough worry was upon us, we decided to try and check it out. So we all got up and began to stumble through the darkness without flashlights as to maintain stealth, attempting to get closer to the truck. This entire time, I just wanted to sit down slash lay down and was feeling terrible to the buzz. After a good another half hour of doing this, the truck's headlights turned back on and he proceeded to drive back up the trail and turn towards our campsite. Throughout this process, we stayed hidden far from the site. Upon reaching our site, someone got out of the truck, did something, and got back in. Because we heard a door slam shut, it was difficult to see what was happening. Then it backed out, which would have been hard as shit with a trailer late at night on that narrow ass road, and left going just as slow as before, and eventually getting out of sight. We returned to our site, trying to think things out, when we again noticed the truck with its trailer driving noticeably slower than before, at what was probably one mile an hour. This was on a road further away from before, but still headed in the direction of where we were. At this point, we were all genuinely freaked out and didn't want to wake up in the middle of the night to something really bad, or even worse, not wake up at all. We decided to pack up, leave, and go to one of our rental houses that was being used for the summer. That's the end of this story. I know it's not that creepy or scary, but to me just really interesting and the best thing I could think of that actually happened to me for this subreddit. To whoever the hell was in that truck, let's not meet. Unless you were harmless or a park ranger, then stop being creepy and weird please. Side note, to top it all off, we were playing Risk later that night, and one of my friends said while rolling for an attack, and I quote, Conjure me some sixes. Guess what showed up? on all three dice.